Hey, everyone. Hey, guys. Happy Wednesday. Woo! It is time for Core 90 with the community. We are so excited you guys are here and spending this time with us today. And we've got some really, really cool content today that's so directly applicable to what's happening right now in the market. Um, and I can't wait to share about this. I, I can't either. And, you know, I have to tell you guys, part of this is stimulated because we've recently been on uh, on the buyer side of this process that we're now like learning how to handle and and learning how to navigate as agents. And we thought it would be really helpful to just kind of give some perspective on what our experience has been and maybe even hear from a couple of you guys on how it's going for you. This is new for some people. Um, of course, we're talking about the, the new regulation uh, that's come through NAR uh, as a result of those lawsuits to say, hey, listen, we need to get those buyer broker agreements in before you can, can even step inside of a, a house to show. You cannot show a property unless you have a buyer broker agreement in place. Um, this is for everyone's protection. It does complicate things. It's a little different. So some of us may feel a little uncomfortable and not quite used to it. Some people, some agents that I know have been doing buyer brokers from the beginning of time, right? Yeah, it's been um, a long time. Well, and what's been interesting is it, Lexi is totally right. You know, we are actually in the process right now of purchasing a property. And so we did get, we got to go through this and have someone walk us through it. And I will say Lexi is a very high D, right? I'm a very high I. And, and so we had this kind of interesting um, mix of emotions going through this process, right? Because it, it's very invasive and feels new. And it's like, wow. But we're coming out the other side with a fresh perspective on how this can all work and how it can feel. And quite frankly, we've had a great experience. And so what does that all mean? And how do we present it? And how do we leverage? And today, today's going to be really focused on how do we leverage some classic sales modalities into this new reality to get to these signatures with buyers and just keep moving and do even more business than you did before, frankly. And I, I think this is going to be an improvement for everybody who learns how to do it. And today we're going to learn how to do it the right way, right away. So I'm excited for that. So let's just jump straight in. If, if, if you don't have anything else up here at the front, how do you feel about that? Let's do it. Awesome. So we're going to do a little bit of screen share here. Hopefully we'll grab, there we go. Um, so today we're talking about closing buyers today using classic sales strategies, um, classic. So for anyone who needs a little bit of context though on what we're talking about today, we are literally talking about the Nar Nar Banks uh, that just happened here uh, where there was a little bit of a, I don't know, a, a shuffle in the deck, I would call it in terms of what we're dealing with. I don't know if anyone remembers Jar Jar from uh, the the end of the Star Wars <laughs> <laughs> trilogy, I would call it. Uh, it's supposed to be a prequel, but I think it he he kind of ruined it for a lot of people. So the the National Association of Realtors has had a tough year. Right? It's been interesting, right? Yep. Yeah. So um, what's happened though? I mean, what's going on? So a series of like we say here, legal questions that resulted in some lawsuits that um, ended up with some systemic changes in how we go about business. This isn't really up for discussion today in in our opinion on whether or not we agree or disagree whether it makes it better or worse that's not the point the point is you know we update uh legal requirements uh, we work in a compliance heavy uh and mandate heavy um industry we're one of the few industries that are allowed to write contractual agreements without being an attorney so it's kind of a big deal and um and it's really not up to us so uh we're gonna do what we're supposed to do and we're gonna make it more comfortable for our clients than uncomfortable because of the way that we handle it right that's the i love that phrase of it's not um it's not what happened to you it's how you approach what happened right how you react or or um even what respond. happens next right yeah right. and so this is our response is we're gonna do this we're gonna do it right we're gonna help our clients and we're gonna talk about this today Yep. And most notably, the thing that's changed, if, if you're not kind of in the loop, is that buyers now uh, are going to need to sign representation to work with agents, the same as a listing does, right? So it used to be just listing agents had to get these signatures and buyers would sign when they made the offer, right? Now we're just moving that forward in the process to establish a true fiduciary relationship earlier and also establish how 
the uh, the idea of compensation might work, um, and all of that will be contracted instead of something that is kind of up for negotiation later down the road. Um, not necessarily a bad thing. We've been doing that on the listing side since the beginning of time. A lot of agents, like Lexi said, have been doing that on both sides. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to ask. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of behavioral studies out there. Um, Jeff's going to tell you a little bit more about this one. But ultimately, when anyone is considering any kind of a purchase, there's always two, two uh, like the angel and the devil on your shoulder kind of scenario. There are two things at play. There's your there's fear and there's greed. This, there's this perception of what you need or what you want. And then there's the fear of, could be a lot of things, not having it, uh, what will happen if you don't get it, all of those kinds of things. Yeah, it's totally true. And actually, you see this fear versus greed index play out a lot in uh, stock market sentiment, in crypto, if you've been trading any crypto. But what's interesting is this is old. This concept is old. And what I mean by that is we've been looking at fear versus greed as prime motivators for people in their own spectrum. And so most people are operating somewhere in this spectrum, and they'll either be more motivated by greed in a given moment or more motivated by fear. Um, it, we see it in the stock market, people selling off all their stock, that's a fear-based reaction, or people greedily trying to grab it all up and buy a ton, right? And uh, neither of these words are good or bad, but we're going to talk about how they play into motivations and behavioral uh, typology today. How do we use that information to, to motivate people? It's like the pleasure versus pain. Totally. It's, it's not exactly the same, but I mean, I guess it all boils down to the fact that as human beings, we're really motivated by those things that feel good or the things we're afraid of. Yeah, exactly. Well, and so, and one of the things that we're going to overlay with this, which is something we cover a lot um, inside the community, and we're going to keep covering it a lot because it's never going to go out of style so long as humans are still alive, <laughs> which is the DISC profile. And this is a behavioral typology. Um, so we've heard of things like Myers-Briggs and some of those, it's like, oh, I know all about my personality. Personality is interesting. Behavior is a different thing. And DISC tells us about someone's behavior when they're not thinking about their behavior um, versus a personality. Uh, personality is something that can change over time. Behavior is something that's innate, uh, meaning that it's baked into your DNA. This is going to be your behavior just as a knee jerk. I have a great example of you guys have heard us talk about disc a bunch um it's just such a great tool but i have this i was thinking of this story um this morning i have a friend who married an italian guy and she was in italy with his family and they were at his family's uh, uh olive farm i think it was down in um sicily and so they were swimming off the coast of sicily and a, it was she and her uh, sister-in-law. And here she was swimming around, her sister-in-law swimming around. And all of a sudden there were two sharks and her sister-in-law started screaming because they wanted the boat to come back to pick them up because they were in now shark infested waters, freaking out. So she starts screaming. And my friend, her name is Ostrid, started laughing, like uncontrollably laughing, like hysterical, and I, she was telling me the story when she got back from the trip and I was saying, well, what, I mean, did you think it was funny? And she said, no, I was utterly terrified and I had no idea that I would laugh. You know, she was like, I didn't understand it, but that actually is not an unusual response from some people. And it's just her behavioral trait that she didn't expect and nobody expected. Thank goodness her sister-in-law was screaming for help because right. the boat came and got them back. But um, it just goes to show that it is some of those behavioral traits and responses are just from gut instinct. You have, it, it's built into you. It's very much nature, not nurture. That's it. The greatest thing though, is once you know what your nature is or can identify the nature of behavioral patterns in other people, then you can start instilling some of those nurture um, elements. So to help guide the process and people's behaviors a little bit. And that's what DISC is all about is being able to identify a behavioral type of a person um, and, and then flex and help them deflect through a process like what we're talking about today.
Yep, we're going to use this overlay today as part of what we're doing. This is not a pure disk training, so to speak. However, we are going to leverage this. So for those of you who've already trained with disk, you're going to be like, I know disk, that's awesome. Um, and by the way, we think about this, Lexi and I think about this constantly in all of our work. And so this is not ever something I feel like that goes out of uh, style. And we're going to break it down a little bit today. If you haven't been exposed to this, I'm super glad you're here because this will change your entire sales career. Um, this, this is something that we use uh, big time. So this disk segments or the, or the four uh, behavioral types, um, we're going to go much deeper on all of these here coming up. But the basic uh, acronym that D-I-S-C stands for is dominance, influence, steadiness, and conscientiousness. So it's often formatted like a disc, D-I-S-C, which is um, interesting and helpful. And you'll see it's a bit of a quadrant there. So there are some shared traits between some of the um, uh, behavioral patterns. Um, like, for example, outgoing shares the D, the high D or dominance people and the influence people. Um, people oriented are the influence people and the more stabilizing people, those S's that love community. Reserved is more the stabilizing um, and cautious. So those people that are really detail oriented, they want the facts and figures, those C's, they're really more reserved and also very task oriented just like the D's who like to get it done and move on. So what you can see there is everything on the right hand side, the I's and S's, people oriented versus task oriented. And same thing with top versus bottom, outgoing versus reserved. So it's a really easy hybrid to look at on this. Let's go a little bit deeper though. We're gonna break down what these are. We're gonna talk about the key fears and motivators. And one of the key things that we're gonna to do today is a little bit of role play. And we even have a, a series of scripts to give you guys that apply to each of the DISC behavioral uh, modalities to get people comfortable with this new idea in the buyer world. Okay, and so this is such a helpful overlay because what we know is there's still only four disc profiles. So you only really need to think about this from these four angles and you'll have 100% of the population under control, which is fantastic. That's what you want. Um, so let's go ahead. We'll talk about D for dominance. Love that little picture there. Hilarious. Um, D's like me, pretty <laughs> direct, results oriented and decisive. Um, I see some of my my peeps out there. Bree, you are a big D. You are such a high D. You are direct result. She's like, let's get it done. Snap, I love snap. I love uh, I love Bree and her like get it done attitude. She's a classic D. Um, motivators are things like control. Um, they like to be in control, whether they are or not. That's a whole different story. But they like to feel like they're in control. They like a challenge. They like competition. Those are not things that they run from. Um, the biggest fears, though, are being taken advantage of. There's nothing that a D, I can't stand it if I feel like I'm being taken advantage of um, or a loss of control or Ooh. being kind of bamboozled. That feeling is not a good feeling for people that are Ds. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now, I'll take the next one because my leading trade is high I. Um, so I stands for influence or impact um, or awesome. Just kidding. Um, so characteristics are the outgoing, persuasive, and enthusiastic. Anyone who knows me, my enthusiasm never wanes. My energy is super high. Why? Because I win with and through people. And so um, high eyes are this way. They tend to be really... Um, uh, outgoing. That's a great way to think of them. Motivators, social recognition, approval, and excitement. These are things that high eyes really thrive on and feel like they need in their environment in order to be successful. So if you have a client, by the way, what we're thinking about today is not if you are one of these things, it's the easy button. Obviously, you could identify yourself, but it doesn't really matter what you are. It matters that you speak to your client in their native language. So if your client's like me and they're a high I, or if they're like Lexi and they're a high D, you need to speak to them in either high D or high I language, or you're going to lose them, especially if you're something else. Um, fears, rejection, high eyes hate being rejected, and they're scared that they'll lose popularity. Okay. Absolutely true. If there's a party, they want to be there. That's totally it. <laughs> High S's. Let's talk about these steady, steady Bettys over here. So what are the characteristics? 
Um, they tend to be patient, reliable, team oriented. They're they're good team players. They want to um, make sure that they're part of the crowd. They're not huge disruptors. Those kinds of things. Um, their motivators tend to be security, collaboration, appreciation. Um, they are. Uh, community builders, so they like to be participative, those kinds of things. Um, their fears are sudden change and instability. And I'll tell you, like S's, we think of them as steady. They're very, they, they're the people that are going to want to be chatty about their family. They're going to want to take a little more time, those kinds of things. But if you put an S in the corner and they feel uncomfortable and afraid of something, they can be your worst nightmare. Oh, Absolutely. True story. Tell, tell me about a, a high S. You, you've dealt with some high S's that are under pressure. Well, my mom is a high S. <laughs> so I can tell you very well about uh, high S's and under pressure. Uh, she, she will be my worst nightmare because she she very much, and I love you, mom, if you're watching this, but she will, <laughs> she will definitely, um, it causes this unbelievable, almost irrational kind of response. And you'll see it many times with high S's where if they lose stability or lose confidence in their place in the world or that they're um, they're going to have sudden change forced upon them, my goodness, it really, it creates a lot of uh, discussion, but also very what we would consider to be emotional and non-rational behaviors. So panic. particularly for high D's. So Lexi is a high D. And if you pair Lexi with a very high S in panic mode, it's a it's a very tough spot actually for both parties, right? Because the high S has ends up having a funeral. That's why. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so, all right, let's keep no, going. But, but I think it's I think it's important to remember this, and I mean this is really important in what we're talking about because if an S starts to feel insecure and unsure of what's happening or what their role is they will hit that kind of fight or flight mode mm -hmm. and they kind of get in panicsville and it can be difficult to bring them down. That's when it's really essential that we understand like when I'm, if I'm, if I know I'm a high D and I'm working with an S I number one, don't want to trigger them into that panic mode. But number two, if they are in that panic mode, I know that I need to flex mm -hmm. away from my natural tendency to be like, dude, it's not that hard. Sit and simmer. We'll get it figured out. Like I can't do that to a high S, right? I have to be more calming. I need to backtrack and re-explain. I need to create some calm. I need to, you know, whatever it is that I, that to sedate their fears. Right. So I have to be able to flex my own style, my own behavioral pattern. So that's where we say, like, in this case, it doesn't necessarily matter what your type is unless you're having to flex to deal with somebody who's in fear mode. Right. Well, and just to, to put it in perspective, the crosses here, these hybrids, or excuse me, the crosses are where the, the greatest difference exists. So D and S don't share a boundary. So they're the furthest apart from each other. Same with I and C. They are the furthest apart from each other. So high C's and high I's tend to have a hard time together. High D's and high S's tend to have a hard time together. They are rare, there are rare people who are actually across between these things, but it's very rare. Um, and so just so you know, if you're a high D, high S's are going to feel like you're kryptonite and vice versa. And same thing with I's and C's. Not good or bad, just something to be aware of. It means it will require a lot of energy from you to flex into that department. Let's keep going. Conscientiousness or calculators. Um, so high C's are analytical. They're detail-oriented. They're very systematic. Uh, my father is a high C, so I'm, I'm very familiar with this. Very, very concrete sequential. Never met a spreadsheet he didn't love, right? So this is very, very classic high C. Their motivators are accuracy and quality and expertise. Now, what's interesting to think about, guys, is as we're entering kind of this new reality where we're needing to get signatures in advance of even opening a door, you can imagine that accuracy and quality and expertise are going to be important. We're going to talk about all this stuff today and how does this overlay with what we're dealing with right now. Fears, check these fears out. Criticism, which is being wrong, by the way. That's really a, a, a fancy way of saying being wrong and making mistakes. 
So anything having to do with making mistakes or being critical or being wrong, uh, a high C that puts them in meltdown mode. Why? Because they they view themselves as very conscientious and analytical and detail oriented. So if you if they find out or if they're told or if they feel like you think they've made a mistake or that they're wrong, they will move away from you, not away from the wrongness. Do you know what's interesting to me is I think sometimes even though they're kind of on the opposites, high I's and high C's they both have this factor of acceptance, right? They both really need to get it right, but it's in a slightly different way. Meaning the C's are rule followers and I's are, they want to be included in everything, right? So they, they want to be everybody. They're both people pleasers, but in different ways. I's want to be the life of the party. They want to be friends with everybody. They want everybody to like them. C's want to be the rule followers. They don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to, you know, they're the people that slow down when they look down and notice they're going 57 and a 55. They're, you know, those people. Super true. So the, as we mentioned earlier, one of the things that we're going to talk about today then is leveraging each of these four segments of the disc how do we now have this new type of conversation around signing a buyer broker representation agreement up front? And by the way, if for those of you who maybe jumped on a minute late, um, I will tell you, this is something we've just done, right? We're purchasing a, a property. And so we had to actually sign this document. It was very interesting to be on the receiving end this early in the process. Now we're fortunate. We, you know, we did this with a very experienced agent. Um, I feel like they handled it terrifically well. Um, and and we, I, I, I'll speak for myself. I had some discomfort with the document, which is interesting. Right. And so how can I expect other people not to um, when I myself looked at this and went, OK, hold on, I got to make sure I understand what what are we doing here? And it was fascinating. And I can say now, having gone through it one time um, or being in the process, it my fears are allayed hugely um, in terms of how this all feels. But as with anything new, and I'm a high eye, I'm willing to usually be like first adopter, like I'll jump off the cliff before I've got the parachute on kind of a thing. Um, but I will tell you, it it uh, I learned through the process. So we're going to cover some of that today and how this all aligns. So um, I want to, two things. Um, I'm curious, since we have um, a, a group that can manage this right now, if you guys will put your own disc, your number one disc, uh, behavioral type for yourself. Mm. If you know what you are, put it or what you think you are, please put it in the chat. So we know Jeff is an I and I'm a D. Yep. We've Casey got Lynn of... is an I. Oh, Liz measured, you know, Liz, I'm, I'm like that too. Um, i actually flex really hard in all four directions. So S is my lowest one. Um, but I can have S tendencies and it changes in your life. It, what's interesting is you're a good flexor. You get along with a lot of different people. You have a lot of intuitive um, EQ. You have a high EQ. So you're able to relate to people. And so you flex really easily. And that's what um, tends to show up when you have people that um are that are kind of balanced out on all of those things. Yep, we have Robin Schamberger says uh, she's an I. Yep. Uh Bree Bree says I'm just super B. I what don't is, know what that means. What yes, is I do. I do know. I do know we can't say it on the uh, training. And then uh Doug says he's a D. Absolutely. Um Stephanie says I don't know. Interestingly, by the way, inside your EXP login now, EXP's um added a disk assessment in there. You can actually take one for free just because you're with the company. So I you can log in and take one uh, very easily. So interesting when you get the results back to kind of read a little bit about it. And you you may, I find that I usually agree with most of uh, the assessment and the insights. And Desiree is one of our goofy cross hybrids. I love it. Thank you for sharing Desiree. A DS. Mm -hmm. By the way, that it, I, I've known some people who are DSs. I've known some people who are ICs. Um, and so the, it's it's not to say that it's not possible. It's just to say it's very rare. So you're, you're definitely special in that department. Jeff, where's the assessment? My EXP. 
Um, yeah. Uh, Liz, I'll find the link and I'll post it um, for everybody after this when we when we post the video. But it's it's very cool that the company's integrated that now. Yet another uh, feature that EXP is given to you for free. Um, and you can use them on yourself. You can use it on a prospect. Really exciting. Um, and your husband, Desiree, is an IC. Holy moly, you guys. Talk about a house divided. That's exciting. Uh, very fun. <laughs> So let's jump in. This will be this will be exciting. And by the way, knowing yourself is important, right? But what was it that you said, Lex? It's it's not just knowing yourself, but today, what what are we really focused on? Well, you want to know what your client is. You want to learn how to make some snap uh, assessments on the disc style of your clients. And maybe it is, you know, you're working with a couple in a lot of cases. So with Desiree, man, you'd have your work cut out for you because you're, you've you've got to hit all four of those styles um, when you're when you're working with them. So you've you're you've really got to hit all the bases there. Um, provide a lot of information in a lot of different formats, um, which I actually find really fun. And just um, if you you know, like I said, to reiterate, the most important thing about knowing what your own style is is so that you can flex appropriately to kind of uh, uh, mirror and match your client mm -hmm. um, because responding as a high D to a high S just doesn't work or uh, as a C to a high I that is really going to annoy them. If you're sending them documents with all this data, they're going to be like, and they're going to go find another agent. It's true. If, if you notice with a high S, for instance, as a, as a high D that you you leverage your natural behavioral profile, there's a high likelihood that they will get emotional and feel violated in that circumstance. So it's it's very interesting how these things play out. But today we're going to talk about flexing. That's exactly and right. You know what's fun, Stephanie? When you find out what you are um, or what your tendencies are, it will be fun for you. I will challenge you to keep those things in your head, what D, I, S, and C are. And if you're watching your whatever your favorite show is, let's say you're watching Friends. This is actually a really fun one. Like you're watching Friends. I like to try to identify like what all the characters are and we'll have like discussions. We'll like actually hit pause and be like, I don't think that they're an I, I think they're a D. Well, why do you think that? And then, you know, it's just, it's fun. But this is literally a language that Jeff and I speak mm -hmm. regularly. All the time. Um, yeah, we'll meet someone new and and have a conversation about it. it's interesting because they're a high I, but did you notice they have some high C tendencies or something like that, right? So we can speak that language and it gives you a behavioral language now that you can leverage with other people or just with yourself as you're starting to think about clients. There's never been a client that we've ever worked with where we don't have in the notes what their primary disc is. And that's connected to an understanding of their motivators, their fears, all sorts of things. So this is super powerful. And we we even leverage this in terms of our CRM uh, strategy. You, I, I know people, by the way, who literally send out four different types of marketing. And it's based on the person's uh, dominant uh, profile because they know how successful that will be. Well, and think about if you work with a, a transaction coordinator, for example, or you have an assistant, a showing assistant or anything like that. Um, or a partner, and you want to, there's nothing worse than I'm working with a client, I've been working really hard, maybe they're a difficult, demanding high C, for example, they want a lot of detailed data, they want a lot of numbers and all of those things. And I've been flexing really hard to make sure that I'm responding in a way that's keeping them happy. And then I have a transaction coordinator that calls them to set some stuff up and that transaction coordinator is a high eye. And she's like, I'm going to set you up on your inspection. And, oh, I don't know who it is, but we'll figure it out. That's not going to fly with my IC, right? So being able to like even train the people that you work in partnership with can be helpful so that they don't screw it up or make them feel uncomfortable. And, and just honestly, so that they have successful conversations with those clients too. Um, because it, that can feel like whiplash for clients. And we all know it's fun to buy a house. It's exciting sometimes to sell a house, but also it's stressful. And also sometimes it's not a good thing. Sometimes it's difficult. It's because of a death or um, a financial circumstance or a divorce or any number of things. So, 
you know, we have to, we want to always try to keep it as even for people as possible. This upset, I'm going to just say this and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. This, the fact that we think this is hard or it's harder, it's a challenge. And we have, we're putting a lot of thought into this new document that we're getting signed. Honestly, you guys, it's harder for us as agents than it is for our clients because most clients don't know the difference. Right. There, this is no different than explaining what a seller property disclosure, you know, is or what the agency uh, disclosure is or wire fraud. I mean, any of those documents that you are sending to your clients um, to be compliant and to make sure that all of your documentation is in order. This is just one more of those. Yep. But it, but in case and in case because it does lock people in a little bit more um, on the buy side that some buyers may not be used to. I mean, every seller on earth who's ever sold a house, at least in the states, has an agreement most likely with one agent. Right? They're locked in to a contract with one agent. And if they don't want to work with that agent anymore, they have to terminate the contract and find someone else that they're also going to have to be in a contractual agreement with. It's the same dang thing, just on the buyer side. And, and actually, look at this, right from Brie, uh, one of our awesome uh, superstar agents here. And she said, it's true. I just explained uh, to a lead, an online lead, that an agreement would be required to view, explain the terms, and they were fine with it. Of course they were. Probably because you sounded fine with it and you were secure and there's there was probably good alignment in terms of how you um, spoke with them uh, to complement their disc. So let's dive into this and let's talk about what are the adjustments that we may need to make with various people to understand their motivators and their fears. And depending on where they are on that fear versus greed cycle, we can we can catch them in the right way and make sure that we allay any fears or uh, or lean into any motivations to get them moving forward. Yeah, right? this will just help you avoid any pushback, honestly. People want what they want. Listen, they're showing up to buy a house, right? Your job is to help them. It's part of the process now. So it's really just about allaying fears and helping them get, get moving forward. All right. So selling to a D buyer, you got to take this one. And selling to you, you mean, yeah. And what we mean by selling to is like, it's just talking through this document with people, be direct, focused, and efficient, highlight the bottom line and how it's the agreement benefits them. Um, and we're going to actually give you some scripts here in a minute. Leveraging the motivators is emphasizing the control that they have over the buying process, making sure they understand that that this actually bolsters that. It does not diminish that. Uh, present the agreement as a way to streamline decisions. Because they like efficiency. Yep. And addressing their fears, reassure them, again, that they're in control. Provide clear, concise information to avoid feeling like they're being taken advantage of. I will also say as a high eye, and I make this mistake all the time uh, with my amazing wife here, uh, which is don't overspeak, especially if you're a high eye. Don't talk too much. Don't talk too much. Um, high Ds like conciseness. They like bullet points. Uh, they don't need 6,000 words when six words would do. Um, you're not actually making the relationship any better by talking more. You think you are, but you're not. And I'm speaking from personal experience. So uh, this is just something to be to stay aware of. With high eyes, um, it's one of my selfies there on the left, um, selling to a high eye buyer, be enthusiastic, be engaging, and sociable. By the way, let still let them talk, interestingly. Um, keeping them talking will keep them feeling comfortable. That's their comfort zone. Highlight the positive experience and the ease of working together about the contract, about this entire process, the fact that you're excited about this process. I am so thrilled we're going to get to work together and I get to work with you, right? They're the celebrated we're gonna commodity. We're going to have fun. fun. to get started. Like a party. This is the party document. Let's go. <laughs> um, leverage their motivators. Focusing on the relationship building aspect of the agreement, Right. This says that we get to work together. We're going to build a relationship. I'm so excited to get to know you even better, right? You're focusing on the relationship, not on compliance. I, I'll tell you right now, high eyes aren't as concerned about compliance. They're concerned about being liked. Um, and then emphasize the excitement and benefits of being part of an exclusive group, right? This is awesome. You're going you're gonna to sign this and then you're going to be one of my clients. We're going to work together. You're in the family. I can't wait, right? This is where the party's at. It's exciting. 
And then addressing fears, um, ensure that they feel valued and not rejected, right? We can talk about how to do that. We've got some scripts for that today, which is going to be really exciting. And then uh, keep the conversation light and just focused on benefits. That's the biggest part. Selling to an S buyer, you've got to be patient, supportive, and sincere. You've got to hear them out. So being a good listener is a big one with a high S. Um, stress the stability and security that the agreement provides. Remember, they don't like change. So I wouldn't say, you know, hey, this there's a change to our documentation. This change has been really unusual yeah, and no. awkward for agents. This is a big change in what we're doing. Don't, don't say that. Just be like, okay, so the first document before we can get started looking at houses, which will be super great. Can't wait to go to all those neighborhoods you picked out um, is we got to do this agreement and just again, shuffle it. It goes right on in with all of your other stuff, your agency disclosures, all of those things. This is to ensure that you're safe, right? You could even say that. It's true. Yep. Um, highlight the team oriented nature of the agreement, that it solidifies your relationship. Remember, they want to know that it's set in stone, it's bedrock, uh, not going to happen, that there's going to be anything shaky. Um, emphasize long term benefits and reliability. Um, reassure them of your commitment and the lack of those sudden changes, that right. no one else is going to work with you. You'll be, you know, you'll, you may talk with my, transaction coordinator to set up things like appointments, but they are amazing. You're going to love working with them. I've been, uh, you know, she's been my partner for a long time, all those kinds of words to just reassure them um, and address any uh, concerns about, you know, or, or instability about moving forward. Um, I, I, you know, S's just need reassurance. Yep. They need to know that it's all going to be okay. So selling to a C. So high C's need thorough, detailed, and factual approaches. And what, what's best for them is if you can provide something that's like an in-depth explanation and then data to support this agreement, that'll be very helpful. Um, they're also very compliance driven. And so creating alignment by talking about how you are very excited about compliance will make them feel good about you because they're excited about compliance. And if you're excited about compliance, then we're the same. Same tribe equals good. I'll sign. Um, Leverage their motivators. Focus on the accuracy and the professionalism of this agreement. Um, and then highlight how this meets high standards of quality and especially legality. Legality is kind of the ultimate standard of professionalism and, uh, and the data to support this agreement, right? So we know that this is a good thing because this is all about the law and making sure that everyone is compliant and protected with a contract that states as such. And then addressing any fears. Be open to answering detailed questions. I will tell you, your high C's are the ones who will have 64 questions about everything, right? And that is not, they're not being mean. They're not being rude. They're not trying to make you angry. <laughs> high D's, Brie, right? They're not, they're not wanting to piss you off. They, they are, however, driven by understanding things, right? Theoretical understanding is super important to a high C. And so they need to, their sense of calm and safety in the world is through understanding how things work, right? They take telephones apart. One thing with a C is that they sometimes have a hard time making decisions. Mm. And so it's your job to kind of guide them. And if then statements or, uh, now later statements are great. So we'll sign this now. And then later this afternoon, we'll head out to go look at those houses. You need to put kind of a time frame in there for them to encourage them to just get it done and move on because they tend to be the people that will look and look and look and look for more questions or the need for more information before they pull the trigger. So it's the, they're the aim, 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 not the aim fire. <laughs> so you have to help them just pull that trigger and, and get it done. That's absolutely right. Um, and so one of the questions that I think would come up in this circumstance is, what do I do now? Right. So we've got this information. We understand now the hopefully the overlay of disk and how this can um, be a part of our process, understanding people's disks. And we're going to do an exercise with this in a minute. So we understand um, who some maybe famous disk profile people are out there in case you're still going, well, I don't know what this high D, high I thing. Who are these people? And what is what is the this, that and the other? 
we'll start to identify some famous people who fit into each of these categories. Um, but the very first thing that you're going to need to start doing, and I, we, we would recommend that you start making this part of your daily process, is identify your prospects disc right away during conversation. And by the way, we treat this like it's a game. And so the way that you gamify this is you just start doing it all the time. And by the way, partner with someone. Um, if you have a business partner, if you have a friend in the industry, if you have a friend who's a lender, start speaking disc with them about everyone that you meet. And it's a great way, even when you're, if you watch television, don't just watch television and let your brain float off into, into poop world. Just instead, watch television and use the opportunity to say, this character, let me figure out what's their primary disc. And that is going to be amazing. Because eventually you'll start to just have a, a knee jerk. You'll understand immediately what someone is. That's step one. Step two is to have an immediate understanding, once you know that, of this person's motivators and their fears. And I will tell you, in under probably three seconds, when Lexi and I meet someone new, we not only know what their disc is, but we then therefore know what their primary motivations and primary fears are in the world. And having that information at your fingertips is amazingly beneficial, especially in a sales type of an encounter, right? Which we're all in sales. That's just the truth. And sales isn't a four-letter word, guys. Sales, well, sale is, um, but <laughs> it's it's a good thing. This is ultimately, uh, Zig Ziglar says everyone's in sales. They just may or may not know it. Um, and so this is what we do. Then you speak to their motivators, meaning what are the things that motivate them? right? If they're a high S and they're motivated by closeness and family, then we're going to speak to that. Um, if they're a high D and they're motivated by uh, expeditiousness and efficiency, then we're going to speak to that. Um, if they're a high C and they're motivated by correctness, we're going to speak to that. But we're not going to cross lanes and speak to our own motivators, right? That's different. Um, this is what the classic mistake is. I'm speaking with a high C, but I'm a high I. And I'm like, this is going to be so much fun. And they're like, I don't care, right? Because I just missed everything that matters to them in one statement because what was I doing? I was selling to myself. I was screaming at them in Italian, even though they speak Chinese is the way to think about that, right? That doesn't make them understand you. It just makes them pissed off. Number four, speak to their fears. And we're going to talk about how to do that in a way that acknowledges their fears, maybe puts a little bit of pressure on that, right? What? Why do we do this? Well, it's the same way as when you go to a massage therapist, what do they do? Do they find all the parts that already feel good and just you put their energy there? No. A massage therapist finds the part that what? Hurts a little. And what do they do? They put a little bit of pressure on it until that hurt relieves. And this is something that we can do in a sales process. It works much the same way. It's a good thing because ultimately they need to have their fears assuaged, meaning uh, that you've released their fear. You've released that little hurt spot in the massage. And then number five, now let's go find the perfect house. So we're going to talk about how to how to get to that part of the process as well and how to use some classic closes for this. So hopefully this is helping a little bit, but let's go into some kind of classic examples because I think this is where we can also um, help people to understand this a little bit. Uh, I have to a fun link. Ooh, fun. All right. So Bree says, I just started the conversation uh, with, are you aware of the new changes? And everyone says, no, of course not. Right. Because they're not watching the real estate news channel every day. What do, who's watching that? Real estate agents, right? So unless your client is a real estate agent, which good luck with that, um, then you should be you should be fine. Yeah, Stephanie's laughing. Exactly, right? That's that's not the everyday scenario. Um, so um, actually, Bree, are you? Do you when you ask that? Are you going to keep asking that, or are you now thinking most people don't know? So you're just going to skip over that and just go right into it. Uh, actually, uh, what I've found is when you ask that, um, you can kind of gauge what their disc is by their answer. Yeah, that's a, such a great that's such a great example. It's a good opportunity to just one find out if they are aware of it, and that way you can kind of gauge you know what their disc is and how much you need to explain or not. <laughs> yep. I mean, obviously we have our duties, but. Um, yeah, some people want to know more. Some people don't. Some people are like, yeah, okay, I understand. So now we have to sign this to see a house and 
you know, what we just tell them is, um, you know, there, it comes with a compensation agreement. Um, but it, when you're ready to write an offer, there's an opportunity to ask the seller to cover that for you, just like you would with closing costs. And we haven't had it really any pushback. Right. The, mm -hmm. the average, the average consumer, uh, assumes and, and rightfully yeah. so that all yeah. of this regulation is there for them. Yep. So that's just what we've been using to open up the conversation. I love that. That's, fine. that's, that's fantastic. Awesome. Yep, and you'll notice no meltdown. Bree's not crying. <laughs> All is well. She's the world keeps selling houses. The world keeps spending. Well, and the funny <laughs> yeah. thing, too, bring me some buyers. <laughs> that's it. As a buyer, I can tell you, if you got to sign it to move forward, what do you do? It's that's the only way through the door. You got to unlock yeah. the door. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to show her some condos this weekend. So yeah, no yeah. problems with no problems with the one I just did like two days ago. That's great. I yeah. love it. So. And I love, you know, Stephanie says, if you're, if you're calm um, and confident, then they will be too. And that's the thing. And, you know, I, you could even go the opposite way of free and not even say it's a change. Don't even sure. let them know that it's a change. And then if they know that it's something different or new because they purchased a house recently or whatever, or they just remember from last time, then you can say, oh, right. So this is a new, we, we do have a new required document. It's required in every single state. Like, I love doing that because it's like, have you guys ever, you know, we're taught you should always read every letter of a contract. Well, yes. But how many times do you like when you're accepting the terms and conditions, for example, like on a, on like a new app that you've downloaded Your or something. Car insurance, right? right? Kind yeah. of like, and if I don't agree, what happens? And I don't get the car insurance. So like, eh, I mean, you should read it because you need to know what you are agreeing to. Um, but at the end of the day, most people, I think, hear that it's a required document. They're yeah. going to, you know, and I would, I treat it like anything else in the contract. I, I go through it with them, explain it, all the points, and then answer any questions and then move on. Right. And so the whole, whole point of today was to help put together some of your thinking and some of the verbiage so that you are able to have this conversation, go through this paperwork and not have it be a big deal. That's it. Um, and because the first step of any conversation, in my opinion, is putting it in, um, you know, in, in terms of their disc so that they, you know, they hear the language that's comfortable for them and all of that stuff. Um, so Let's look at, I before we move into some of the specific language, there's a link um, that yeah, I grab that for the that one little picture that we have. We're going to share with you just kind of this fun little poster thing of some famous people that hopefully most of us know and their disc type, which I think most of us would um, completely understand this. Let's We're like, like oh, yeah, that makes sense. Although there are a couple in here that I was like, huh, I wouldn't have known that. All right. So here we go. So this will give us some famous examples of D's, I's, S's, and C's. So why don't you take D's? Donald Trump, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Doc, or, uh, Judge, Judge, Judge Judy. Judy, Barbara Walters, and Oprah Winfrey. For All sure. high D's, right? Mm -hmm. They're getting stuff done. They're going to be used short answers, short responses, and they're driven by bullet points. Um, and they're not afraid to get into conflict. Not afraid of conflict. Not afraid to say you're fired. Not afraid to whatever it is, right? Um, and those are those are classic examples of high D's. Um, one thing that I had said to me a long time ago when I was just learning this was uh, a high D might be like a, a military commander, right? Like this is a person who's not afraid to to chop something down and they're not afraid to say no, right? Those, those are really great examples. Also, uh, Michael Jordan, Robert De Niro, Hillary Clinton, those are all also high Ds. Okay, we've gotten both sides of the political spectrum, so yeah. we're good on that. Um, high eyes, Richard Branson, Jim Carrey, there's a classic example of a high eye. He get, the guy can't help himself, right? Robin Williams, another classic example. Uh, Ellen, uh, Dolly Parton. Those are people who are really, really motivated by how people think of them or how people see them. And also what you'll notice, look at Jim Carrey or Robin Williams, really great examples. They can't be in a crowd without wanting to be the center of attention, performing, right? Yeah. That performing element. Um, and in, Clinton is also a high I. Totally makes sense. So Hillary is a D, he's an I. Makes sense. Really, really good stuff. Give us some high S's. 
Um, Nicole Kidman, which I would have figured she was a, an I just on blush, but I don't know her very well. Nelson Mandela. That makes sense. Tom Hanks. Yep. Jackie Chan, Julia Roberts. Yep. Um, also Mother Teresa, Gandhi, Halle Berry, and Jimmy Fallon. Yep. <laughs> in case you're curious. <laughs> so these are these are really great examples. And and remember that high S's are motivated by community, building community and togetherness. So when you think of someone like a Mother Teresa or a Gandhi, right, that gives you kind of a good profile of somebody who's really motivated by societal good, togetherness, not all about themselves, like a high I might be, right? Um, so it's it. There's just a difference there. And let's do some high C's. Bill Gates, right? Very concrete, sequential. Al Gore, um, all about the numbers and facts and data. Warren Buffett, definitely driven by the markets. Holy calculator, Batman, right? J.K. Rowling um, and uh, and James May. And so these are all folks who are super motivated by correctness, by accuracy, by numbers, by systems um, and detail. Also, Albert Einstein, and two that surprised me, Clint Eastwood and Kevin Costner. Absolutely. So gives you some examples, right? So as you watch, like, for instance, Lexi was talking about, you know, whether you watch a TV show, like a Friends or something like that, um, you know, I, I think it's really thrilling to whenever you're watching anything to try to evaluate what's this person's intuitive disc. Um, very interesting if you watch, I don't watch the news anymore, but I used to. And in the news, everyone is kind of performing a little bit. And so now you also have this opportunity to read through their performance and try to figure out what's their intuitive behavioral profile. When you get better at this, that's kind of like an even elevated level because you're trying to read through the, the performance. It's really fascinating. Okay. So we have a, um, a, uh, a slide that we've put together here that gives you a little example of um, what do I do now? Oh, here we go. Um, of some scripts that you can leverage in each of these instances. And we'll zoom in so you guys can see a little bit better. It's a bit of a cheat sheet for you. Um, and I recommend like, if you're cold calling, for example, <clears throat> um, have a disk cheat sheet for yourself. Just create a sheet somewhere that shows disk and kind of the main motivators and fears and characteristics, and maybe even some of the language. We've got some of these on um, uh, on another disc training that we did. And then as you're talking to people, just I identify, oh, this is an I, and then look at some of the words that you want to be using and that kind of a thing. But we'll also post this up um, when we post the uh, the video. So let's talk about um, what we're looking at here in terms of D's. Are you ready? Yeah, you bet. Sorry, Jeff is shifting the the screen around a little bit on me. <laughs> Sorry, guys. What's going on? All right. I can't tell you what I'm going to tell you. Here we go. Okay. Trying to make sure we can fit it all. There we go. You got it? You betcha. Okay. So we know that the characteristics, motivators, and fears of the D's, of the dominant characteristics, are up there in the corner. But let's think about if you had to say something to the motivators. So like if you're basically trying to say something so that they don't feel uncomfortable about signing this document, you can say much like the listing agent and the seller, this exclusive agreement gives us negotiating power as a contractual team. Remember, they like D's like to be in control. They like to dominate. They want to be able to compete. So that is the language that they're going to hear that. They're going to feel comfortable and confident with you as an agent if you're using language like that. Something also like, ultimately, you always have command of the outcome. This agreement aligns my actions with your intent. Woo! Man, if Bree, if you heard that, how would you feel, right? You're in command. <laughs> she said, hand me a pen. <laughs> now speaking to their fears, and these are some things that you can start incorporating in your spiel when you're talking to people too, so that you're basically overcoming the objections or the fears, even before they have a chance to articulate that. And that's the best scenario, right? Is when you've said enough for them to feel confident that they're just like, yeah, great, cool. Let's do it. Like, like Brie said, give me the pen. So to speak to someone's fears, if they're a D is something like, if something isn't working, you can always terminate this agreement. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> something along those lines. Like I say that even with the contract, like with the listing, I'm like, look, if it's not working out, 
I'm not going to hold your feet to the fire. Like we'll come either figure it out or you can always terminate and I will honor and respect that from you. I mean, that's just, at least that's how I handle that. I love telling D's that they can fire me because um, they like hearing it because they knew it anyway. So I'm just saying something they were already thinking. Um, so then to say something about, you know, this change came about to ensure that buyers receive the highest quality negotiating skills from their agents. Yep. I have this expertise and I will work on your behalf to secure the best terms for your purchase. So it's basically just saying like, this is just a, something that ensures that you get to work with someone that has your folk, you know, only your, uh, uh, well, I mean, you should have that anyway. So it's, I don't know. It's, a, anyway. it's a true fiduciary um, agreement. It's a and that's agreement. And that's what we're doing now, which is awesome. Under the high S category, um, we already have characteristics. S motive, or, or sorry, I. We're going to eyes next, guys. Um, we're going to speak to their motivators. And so remember, high eyes are like, um, I would say what is, is uh, trying to think of one of our, uh, Jim Carrey, Robin Williams, right? We had said that. And so one, if we're speaking to their motivators, which are social recognition, approval, and excitement, we could say most of my clients are so pleased to have this agreement in place so we can get the house hunting or get to house hunting together. And to say something like, I am so excited to get this knocked out so we can get down to the fun stuff, right? Anytime I can lean on fun or together, that's awesome. Um, I see a question uh, here or comment from Liz Boisvert. Liz. Yeah, hi. So, you know, I do Zillow a lot. It's one of the ways that I built my business. And I'll have a conversation with them. Do you have qualifying questions that you might just ask someone to really get to their disc quickly because you have any suggestions on how in, you know, a two yep. minute phone call, I, by the end of it, I know what their disc is so that the next time I meet them, I know where to start. Yep. My very favorite one would be to tell me a little bit about yourself and what you're trying to accomplish. And, uh, from that one question, if they talk for 25 minutes, they're either an S or an I, and depending on what they say, you'll be able to tell if they talk, if every sentence starts with I. Well, just answer. So if the question is, tell me a little bit about yourself, a D is going to say, or, you know, tell me a little bit about what you're looking for. A D is going to be like, we just had a baby. So we need a bigger house. We need a three, two big backyard. Uh, I'd like a pool. I'm trying to get it done pretty quickly. They're just, they're going to list it out. A high eye is going to be like, oh my gosh. Well, okay. So we just had a baby and now we're thinking that we might need a second room um, for the kids because we don't really want them sharing because the baby might cry like something like that. Or we're big entertainers. So we want an open floor plan because we always have people over. Okay. That's an I. A C will be like, um, I took a job and we know that we want about 1500 square feet, definitely not bigger than 2000 because I don't want to clean more numbers. than that. Now they're Earth. talking numbers. They're being really specific. And the S is going to say, you know, we've spent a lot of time thinking about school districts and, you know, right now my daughter's going to this school, but we were thinking that when she moves into middle school, it might be better to be over here. And also my husband works close to there. So it would limit, you know, he would go from a 25 minute drive to like a 12 minute drive, which would be really great. Plus I play soccer near there and, you know, they're going to be like, blah, 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 the S's. So that for me, it's, you know, if it's just get down to the facts, that's a D. If they're like excited and want to tell you about like their lifestyle, that's an I. C's are going to use numbers and be really specific. And those S's are going to be chatty Cathy's. A couple other tricks. Uh, D's and I's are very comfortable interrupting and being interrupted, by the way, both. Um, S's and C's are not. And um, uh, I's and S's are uh, natural smilers. They tend to want to smile. It's part of how they express their excitement and enthusiasm. And, and it's also kind of their way of rolling on their back and showing their belly. Like, um, But uh, <laughs> D's and C's don't tend to smile as much. And it's not, it's not for lack of having a good time. It's literally just not an intuitive facial thing that they do. And so if you notice somebody who's really smiley and interrupts, they're probably an I. So you can use that as a bit of a hybrid as well. Great yep. advice. Thank okay. you. You bet. All right. So let's pull this back up and we'll do the other two categories here. Um, here we go. Uh, oh, actually, let's finish up on the yeah. um, eyes. So on the fears part of the eyes, remember that their fear is rejection, being rejected or losing popularity, right? So 
check these scripts out and how they lean on that button just a little bit. I'd hate for us to miss out on working together, right? That's a really great one. Or I'll sign if you do, <laughs> right? You know, or whatever. You can use that kind of stuff with a high eye. They'll love it. Um, with this agreement in place, you'll have me as your personal shopper and negotiator. And I'm the best, right? That kind of a thing. And with this done, we'll officially be best friends forever, okay? So um, you can have some fun with an eye and they're going to enjoy that about you. In fact, what they're going to hear in their ear if you're having fun is they can have fun with you too. They can be jokey. They can have a good time. They can make it an exciting thing. Um, and that's a good way to build social capital versus this is all super serious and now I've got to be Mr. Serious Pants. They don't want that. I will say that callback is so important with your clients. So like Liz, what we just did with listening for those clues, if a high D says, um, you know, we just had a baby, so we need three more, you know, we need an extra bedroom, then as you're talking to them, make sure you say, um, and then that, you know, we can, let's get moving on finding that extra bedroom so that your toddler doesn't have to share a bedroom with the new baby. Or the high eye is like, you can say, I can't wait to go find this perfect place because I can't wait to come to one of your parties. Like, you know, that callback makes them feel heard. Yep. It makes them feel like you understand. Um, and it also just reaffirms in your brain who you're talking to. You do S's. Okay, I'll do S's. So on, on S's, remember that their motivation is about security, collaboration, appreciation, building community, being together, being safe, right? So let's speak to some of those motivators. Um, we could say this change or this contract, actually, we might want to change that. I'm going to do that right now because um, it would be better for us to say contract or agreement actually is even better. Um, this agreement was made to ensure that buyers have similar protection as sellers do. We want to make sure that you're protected. That's true, right? However, remember what their ear hears is I want to be protected. So that's a good thing for them. Um, next, don't worry. This means I'll be with you every step of the way right? That's a really, really great message for a high S to hear. Um, and also, this allows us to begin searching for your new home. We would definitely say home always with a high S. And it means we can negotiate confidently to be sure you get exactly what you need. And needs are so important for high S's. Um, speaking to fears, right? Their fears are sudden change or instability. So how do we speak to that? Well, this guarantees that no other agent can provide you with conflicting information. It secures our relationship and it means I work solely on your behalf, okay? And lastly, this means I can only do things that are in your best interest to get you your new home, okay? That kind of a thing. That's gonna be really reassuring and feel good because what we're doing is we're just using the right color light here to shine uh, in that corner, makes them feel comfortable. There's no boogeyman over there. It's okay. Um, and high C's. Um, I actually like high C's a lot. Um, I have a pretty high C tendency as well. Um, but they, you know, they're the ones that want the information. They want to be right. They want to be compliant. So this agreement is a legal requirement. Okay. So now they know it has to happen. And so they want to check that box. Because if it's on the list, the box must be checked. So this agreement is a legal requirement. With this in place, I'm able to negotiate on all aspects on, of the transaction. I mean, it, that's really not any different well, except for that, yeah, now you might have to negotiate also for your compensation. But um, this is one of several... Re uh, documents required nationally and at the state level. Once we have it in place, we can begin your search on all the other required documents. So just letting them know it has to be done. So then they will get it done for sure. Um, they're speaking to their fears. Again, remember, they want to make sure that it gets done accurately. They don't want to make a mistake. They don't want to have anything go wrong. So saying things like, I'm a stickler for the rules. So this is always the first document we need to complete. They're going to love that, that you're a rule follower. Um, and then this agreement ensures we've met all compliance requirements, and now we can move forward with your home purchase. Love it. Super, super, super good stuff. And what's, what's amazing about this type of an approach, guys, is that it's so universal. And it may feel out of alignment for you initially because what, what's happening? You are one of these four leading profiles. However, you're not all four of them, 
right? Some some of you might be a little bit more balanced than others. I'm a little out of balance. I will tell you, I have a very low S, like almost non-existent. And so that that is a required flex for me. And I've learned how to flex in that department really well over time. But this is something that just requires thoughtfulness from all of us to say, this other person is not me. And the thing to remember here, and I'm going to repeat it this way because I heard it said to me one time, um, and it made so much sense. Have you ever seen somebody who, like, let's say that you're at um, a a, a shop, and the shop owner, um, their native language is, let's say, Chinese, right? And you get frustrated that they're not understanding you. And so you scream more loudly in English at them. Does that make them understand English better or does that just make you seem even further apart from that person? DISC is like a language for that person. It's their intuitive behavioral language. And if you try to force your style on the other person, it's like screaming at them in the wrong language, right? They're just going to feel like you're kind of a jerk and you don't understand them. And that is why people will naturally want to move away from you instead of toward you. But what's interesting is, how could you have addressed it? Well, if you spoke Mandarin, that's interesting because that person would instantly understand you and feel like you get exactly where they're coming from, culturally, identity, linguistically, all the things, right? So we can do this with our behavior so that we don't accidentally create distance between ourselves and people where we'd like to be doing business. Yep. It's really, really valuable. Yep. So. Okay, so we have a couple of minutes left. Does anybody, are there any questions? Does anybody want to add anything? Tell us a story. What do you, what have you got? I have one more question. Let's do it. Hey, Liz. Uh, I, hi, first day out of the gate, you know, in the Willamette Valley, everything started on the 16th and I happened to have two showings that day. So I was like, well, here we go. Jumping in the pool. Yeah, I didn't want to sit on the front porch and go over these documents. So I explained to them before we met that I would be bringing a document that they would need to sign in order for me to show their home. And I think I'm even going to start emailing it ahead of ahead of time, which I do sometimes with the MLS. So I'll just make it part of that process. And I also brought the agency. Anyways, instead of standing with a pen the second they meet me, because these are Zillow buyers, right? Like, hi, I've known you for 30 seconds let's sign this. I opened the door and we sat at the kitchen table and then we went over the document. Can you, am I allowed to do that? And I was going to ask Bree since she's, I know she's already using them, what her approach was. I mean, ideally we would have like an hour to spend together at an office or a coffee shop beforehand. Right. But that's not always going to be the case, especially with certain buyers. So, Got it. Yeah. I mean, well, so first off, compliance is not my department um, because I, Good on the high eye. We can bring we can bring Bree in here to have this conversation with us. Bree, are you open to that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm just planning to use the SkySlope uh, app. Um, I haven't actually had to do it on the fly yet, uh, but SkySlope um, has an app. Supposedly, we're going to be able to whip those uh, day use agreements out. Um, I think EXP's preference, from my understanding, is that we use theirs. Um, so that's what my, my plan was, is just to send that out. The one that I have that's coming up this weekend, um, you know, I just, I just asked her if she was familiar with it and that was it. And then we just kind of chatted a little bit. And from our conversation, I was able to tell that, that, uh, she was more of an S type. So I was like, all right, I'll send it over. And I just sent it, you know, like regular, but, um, my plan was to have that on my phone was that app. The one, the one thing, you know, that is most critical to remember is ask your state broker. You need to ask yeah. your broker this mm-hmm. question to find mm-hmm. out how to handle it. And I know that right now, um, EXP is doing an exceptional job of having a lot of state meetings on this. There's a lot of information on workplace yep. in the world. Um, so, it, you know, please do get that information. Also, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have um, Holly Mabry from EXP, our vice president um, of brokerage ops. She is absolutely one of the best agents. Um, She used to be my state broker years ago. She is a third generation realtor. She is so knowledgeable. I mean, her brain is like an encyclopedia of all things real estate. And if I ever have a question, um, 
I check in with Holly and she's going to be here to talk to us in a couple of weeks. She's going to do a presentation. Um, So look forward to that. But I mean, obviously, no matter what it is, you guys always check with your broker. I mean, with as many transactions as I've done, and I know Bree and Liz and other agents have done, we all still check if we're writing like a, a, um, some sort of an addendum, or we want to put verbiage in there that we've never used, or we haven't used, or we're not sure about it. We always talk with our broker. So when in doubt, talk to your broker. Um, but remember, it's really important. Your butt is on the line right now on this, and they're taking it really seriously. So opening the door, you know, be careful with that because technically yeah. you really aren't supposed to open the door and show a house unless you have it signed. Um, let's let Desiree ask her question. Hey, Desiree. Hold on one second, Desiree. You've never sounded better, but we're going to unmute you. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) Thank you. Can you hear me now? We sure can. Okay. Um, I just had this conversation with Karina yesterday and, um, what I'm going to start doing is keeping some initial agency disclosures and single property agreements in my vehicle, because that way, if I meet somebody that, you know, I didn't know before, I don't know if I want to work with them. I don't know if I want to sign a long-term commitment to work with them just to open this door for them. So by having the single use or the single property agreements, um, then the first time I meet them, I can say, you know, I'm going to have you sign this just for this property. And you know, as we're getting to know each other, we can, can we can decide if we want to continue to work together and then there will be another agreement. But this is simply for this property so I can show it to you and if you want to write an offer on it. Um, and I think that's a great way to make it, you know, it's they don't have to sign something for six months the first time they get to know me. Yep. That and is vice a versa. Great tool. Yeah, great tool. And And that's true because you don't always want to work with everyone. Liz, you had something there. Yeah. Thank you for that insight. Um, I really feel that it it really does accompany the agency agreement yes. really well. And I think those are conversations that agents haven't been having and they should be. So they just kind of go hand in hand. And it really kind of made, it, I feel like it gave them a sense that I really had the wheel and that I was being professional and I was following the rules. If you'd like the perspective of how it went, one buyer was like, oh, I don't normally sign anything without my dad looking at it because he's in real estate in California. And I said, well, unfortunately, I have to have you sign this in order to see this property. And if you're, I'm sure your dad is up on the new NAR changes. And if I don't have you sign this, then he'll know that I'm not following the law. And so I'm sure that he'll respect that you do that. This is to cover this first house. We're doing a single agreement, but here's a copy of the long-term agreement that when we see the next house, I'll have you sign. So I'm doing the same thing that you are, Desiree, and like having the little binder, you know, with all the different documents inside the buyer tour, because the new buyer tour that EXP has um, is actually updated with this process. So I like to include that too. And the other buyer that I showed... Uh, They were familiar with it because they've been working with a Washington agent. So it wasn't really that new to them. But what it did is it really got their wheels turning on committing to me when they've seen a lot of houses with Washington. And now we have this referral agreement. So it's really just set this bar of professionalism. And the lines are really clear of what it's going to look like for me to represent them. So I think that's going to be one of the silver linings is that we're just taking more. People are going to take us more seriously and our time more seriously. So I look forward to that. I love that. Thank you guys for sharing that. That's super helpful. And um, Liz, I love the way that you handled that. What a, what a brilliant way to, to respond. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I mean, just, it's super respectful and super true. And it showed that you, you've got your stuff together as an agent. Um, That's awesome. I love it. And do remember everybody, and this actually goes to the conversation today that in a moment of stress, Um, And I'll give an example of a moment of stress here in a moment. But in a moment of stress for you, your natural behavioral response will be whatever your primary disc is. And if that's not the same as the other person, your stress response will trigger them. So what I mean here is, let's say that the person pushes back on this contract for anyone in any any, uh, sales encounter. 
someone pushing back on a contract um, and not wanting to participate or not wanting to sign or being like, wait a minute, will create a stress response. Be aware that your primary disc will come out to play right then. And the better you have the reins on your own disc and the understanding of what this person's needs are, that's this is where it is actually the most challenging. But the more you practice this, the easier it gets. You're going to have to flex and it will require energy and awareness, personal awareness um, about yourself in that moment to make sure that you don't blow it. When, when a high C says to a high I, well, I don't feel like I'm, you know, I don't understand this or I'm not very comfortable in the high eyes. Like, oh, just let's get it out of the way. Everyone's doing it. You know, like that's not going to cut it for a high C. And now they're going to feel like you're a spaz and you don't understand them and they will find someone else to represent them. And they probably will sign this contract when it is correctly addressed with them based on their behavior. Yep. Right. So it always is about the person receiving what you're giving them and not about you but you're going to have to keep yourself out of the way. And, and if you get stress triggered, right, in that moment, just be aware that you're going to have to fight whatever your natural tendency is to try to give them what they need, right? They need their medicine, not your medicine. And that's an important differentiation here um, to, to get this done. I, I will say what's fascinating in this process and having just been through this now, I had some lack of clarity, like, okay, well, but wait a minute. What if the what if the person doesn't want to do this? And what if we show up on a property and it's the one that we really like and this, that, and the other? But start thinking, by the way. This is we talk about this in every single sales training that we do, right? There are not as many objections as you want to believe that there are to anything out there. How many real possible objections are there to this process, guys? Figure it out. Maybe four, three. Two, it's not very many. You could probably lump them. People will phrase it differently, but they're saying effectively the same thing, which is I'm either, I don't, I'm not clear, I don't understand it, or I'm afraid that I'm going to have to cough up a big chunk of cash I don't have. That's <laughs> it. It's one of those. It's probably either financial or lack of clarity. So you need to practice, and you can, by the way, because you already know what's coming. There's only two things really coming at you. How will you respond? when that objection shows up for you. And then practice it in each of the four disc categories. If a high D says, I'm not gonna pay you 3%, if you, <laughs> right? If they say that, okay, that's, it's a fine response from them because it's really just a fear-based response. Lack of control, lack of, you know, they wanna own this process and they're not gonna you know, let you toss them around. I'll tell you what, right? I'm the boss. Okay, great. Um, so we're gonna have to practice how do we respond to that? So have a notebook and start really being thoughtful on, okay, well, what could I do? What could I say? How would I respond? By the way, the greatest time to practice this is when you're not in front of an audience, right? You don't practice on stage at Carnegie Hall. You practice for 20 years before that. So practice now, right? Don't get on stage and then practice. Um, you're going to feel very uncomfortable. So start with what you know. Look at your friends, your family members, your kids, whatever it is, um, start thinking about what they are and, and how you respond to them. I will tell you, I, when I, I started applying this with one of my sons who is a really high C, we're really a lot alike in many ways. And I realized that I was responding to him to, cause he's also a high D but my go-to is to respond as a D. And I was thinking it was making sense to him because he was a D and we were just having conflict. And when I realized that generally speaking, when he was calling me with a with something that he wanted to talk about, he was coming from his high C behavioral pattern, not his high D. And when I started responding to him as a C, it literally changed our conversations. And and now, I mean, for the last five years or so, it's been smooth sailing with those conversations, whereas we used to hit these roadblocks and get really frustrated with each other. And then I felt awful because I wasn't a good mom. I wasn't helping him. He felt bad because he was creating conflict with his mom. As soon as I started changing that and responding to him as a C, it like literally, it, it completely there. changed our relationship. It was really helpful. So starting with the people you know the best is uh, I think really helpful, not only is it enlightening and inspiring in your relationships, 
but you really do know it the best. Um, and then start trying it with TV. Like I said, go on and look at our other disc, disc trainings and you'll see we have key words to use. So create a little diagram for yourself, a little quadrant D-I-S-C and start making some notes that you are learning as you learn DISC and keep those in front of you when you're making those calls. Um, or if you've identified, okay, I'm going to go meet with these clients and they're an I and a D. If you're working with me and Jeff, you're working with an I and a D. How am I going to handle this conversation with them? How am I going to address this? And just practice some of those phrases. And actually to your point, um, I, I hadn't even really thought about how much I do this, but I have an avatar, a perfect avatar for each one of these. And they're people I know. So like Lexi is my high D avatar, meaning when I think of a high D, the person I'm looking for is someone who's a lot like Lexi. And if I find that person, I'm like, oh, that's a Lexi. That's a D, right? That's a Jeff. That's an I. That's a Jill, my mom. That's an S. That's a C. That's my dad, right? Like literally, I know exactly who my people are. And when I meet someone and they share a lot of characteristics, then in my mind, I can say, well, what works with mom will work with this high S. Because I have a lot of experience with that person, I can just simply port that level of experience over here, and now we can have a very comfortable um, back and forth without me creating conflict unnecessarily or potentially moving this person away from me and losing the business, right? Because we're all in business. We can't move people away from us or we don't make any money. And at the end of the day, if you're doing business for something other than making money, that's called a nonprofit. You're in the wrong industry. So um, we got to make this work. One thing too, before we wrap up, so um, Liz, you mentioned that you tend to be pretty even in those quadrants um, and that does happen sometimes. Um, one of the things that um, I think if you are talking to someone who's like that and you're just like, dang, like one second, I think they're an S and then I think they're an I and you're just like bamboozled by them. Ask them, a, if you ask a question, you still can't get it, say, so tell me a little bit more. What is it? What's your concern there? Or what is the, you know, what are you, um, what are you worried about? Or what are you thinking about there? Because now they're going to tell you what either their motivator or the fear is behind it. They're going to say, I just don't, I mean, I'm going to be really honest, Liz, I'm kind of embarrassed, but like, I mean, we've always been operating on the fact that when you buy a house, you don't have to pay the commission. And this paper says we have to pay the commission. And our budget's really tight. And now if we have to add like 3% or two and a half percent to pay you, I honestly, I just don't know that we can, we can do that. And we might just need to kind of go it alone. And that's a C, right? What you just did? Well, it could, it could, could be a D, be could a, be a C. It, it okay. could be. So what you're. D would be a little more bossy about it though, right? Probably. I'm not going to give you two and a half person. Right. Like, why should yeah. I pay that out of my pocket? Right. That's a D. I never had to do that before. I'm not going to do that. Right. Forget about it. Yeah, you I'll can buzz off. Damn you can buzz off, kid. So yeah. basically you're saying the objective, if you can't quite put your finger on it, if, um, is to just ask those qualifying questions to know what their fear and their motivators are. Well, which is also, I mean, think about it, Liz, you're, you're such a, an amazing salesperson. And so the reality is asking questions is always a good just reflex anyway, right? Mm -hmm. If I don't understand this person or what's motivating them or how to really behave back and forth, the very best thing that I could always do is just ask a follow-up question mm -hmm. and keep them talking. The less you, and by the way, for anyone who's not familiar with this concept on the call, the less you talk, the more you're in control. It's a really hard one for high eyes to understand, by the way. Um, but the less you talk, the, if they're talking, you're leading because you're asking the question. The, the question is the draw. It's the, um, I, I heard it one time as it's the, oh, what was it? Was it M&Ms or Skittles or whatever that ET, you know, chased after, right? So you're leaving the Skittles. The, the questions are the Skittles and ET is going to the next Skittle each time but you're really leaving that trail of breadcrumbs or whatever. And so I think that questioning, it's its called the Socratic method, right? And this is our opportunity to draw stuff out of them. If you don't know what their disc is, just ask another question. They'll eventually show their cards. Mm -hmm. My guess is the two biggest objections for anybody, regardless of their disc profile, is going to be, does this mean I'm stuck working with you? Right? Like, what if I don't like you? And two... I don't want to have to pay. They're concerned about the money, right? About having to pay you, right? right? 
So, um, and it, it creates a skew, a little U-turn in their budget plans. So if you can handle those two objections, um, then I think it, you know, and, and obviously you want to handle it with verbiage that's going to feel comfortable for their disc, but yeah, that's it. Um, the last thing I'll say too, is if you're going to have people that you love, like your kids or your partner or whatever, do the disc, I highly encourage that, but I do encourage you to try to guess what their primary and secondary, um, disc, uh, traits are before the, you get the results of their test. And discuss that with them, not discussing that with them, but just having that mind for frame your own if, edification just before you see the results. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It gives you a good practice point. And then also with people in your life, it helps you get to that avatar moment a little bit sooner as well. Yeah. So that then have them test. There, there's your validation. But now if you could have a person who's a D, a person who's an I, a person who's an S, and a person who's a C, and you know them really well, you're going to know how you would best answer this question for them. Mm -hmm. And I can just bring, I can bring my mom into a conversation quickly. I do it all the time right? She is my high S. And so if I'm dealing with a new person that I don't have any experience with, I don't know them as well. But if I'm, if I'm able to determine quickly, they're a high S, I'm talking to my mom. Mm -hmm. And for me, that makes it very easy to now have this very comforting conversation. I know what would soothe it for her and would make her feel better. And that is very likely now to work over here because success leaves clues. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, definitely great. I really so appreciate test, it. I'm, I think we're going to do it at our office. It'd be fun as a group to all do it. Some some great disc exercises. And as I mentioned, when you go into the communitycenter.com, there are a number of disc trainings that not only Jeff and I have done, but other people have done. And the, the fun thing about disc is think of it as like a, a transparent sheet of paper that you can overlay on top of anything. So we're talking today about how to close, you know, uh, completing the new buyer's agreement with people. But now take that piece of paper and overlay it on how to close at a listing uh, appointment, how to close, um, you know, for anything, how to, how to call when you're calling for sale by owners or expires, what kind of language are you going to use to try to get an appointment with them? If you, you can use disc with absolutely anything on earth. I'm not kidding. If you're talking to people, if people and talking is, is are, are combined, you can use disc. So start challenging yourself. It's a really fun game. And like I said, watch, if you're watching a show, be like, Oh, wow, that person's a high I. Oh, wow. That person's a high D or I know what that person's fear is. I can tell their fear because they said this. You're going to start getting excited because you'll start seeing it show up everywhere and you can practice this constantly in your life. And it will, I, I can tell you, this is probably going to be one of the more alarming things in your entire sales career. If you start focusing on this, you will start to feel like you have superpowers. <laughs> so good stuff. Thank you guys so much for today. Anything we want to leave them with a parting shot? Uh, nope. Put it on the just spot. go, just go, uh, practice the disc. We love you guys. Thanks for being here. Um, go get some buyers, go close those agreements, sell some awesome houses, change people's lives. We love it. We love you guys. Super excited. Bye guys. Bye.